A resort experience is like a pointless painting. It's lots of little dots that create the overall experience. They may sort of be able to sort of copy one or two dots, but not all of it. If you think about, you know, how do you actually determine luxury? I mean, it's a word that's uh, banded around quite a lot. So they may say that marble and chandeliers are luxury, but the, the real de true definition of luxury is that which is not commonplace, it's rare. There is a resort featuring ritzy villas on an island of the Maldives. Dozens of detached villas shaded by trees. Though it has a magnificent appearance, the rooms stand at a high rate. For instance, one bedroom villa in Sony Fushi stands at 1,500 US dollars per night, which will soar to 4,000 US dollars during peak season from October to Christmas. If the experience worth the price, we invite someone who have been there to show us how Suniva looks like. They have a Yasma 开了一个快艇游船船过来了船过来以后呢船上他就给你冰的毛巾冰的那个香槟和那个椰子就开始服务你们了所以你你在那个几天里面的管家就一直跟着你了最有意思的我们跟着那个他有一个泰国厨师
Uh, those are things you can't do in Shanghai or London or Paris, however wealthy you are. Because take Maldives in, yeah. as an example. You go to one hotel to another, you almost feel that they are pretty much the same. Same, right. right? Apart from the name of the brands. Yeah. So do you think your service can be easily to be imitated? Um, those are physical differentiators. And mm. over time, we've realized that that can be copied. But the philosophy and the culture and the values are much, much more difficult to, co to copy. This, this whole focus, I mean, I, I agree that other resorts also um, encourage their guests to wear, go barefoot. But um, some also have dress codes in the evening, which for the urban rich who are entertaining every evening can be terribly frustrating. We've had guests who've um, been recommended a twin center by the travel agent. So they've, they've been to us many times and um, they're used to being barefoot. So they arrive with their winter boots because they've just come from Shanghai or Beijing in the mm -hmm. winter or London in the winter. And then they go to another resort where they have to wear shoes at night. So they're walking around the restaurant in the Maldives in these winter shoes looking very silly because, you know, the resort insists on that. So um, I, I, I think that those sort of things can be copied, um, having, watching a movie in the open air. But it's an overall philosophy. And I really believe strongly that a resort experience mm. is like a pointless painting. It's lots of little dots that create the overall experience. And they may sort of be able to sort of copy one or two dots, but not all of it. Soniva currently has three resort hotels, namely Soniva Fushi, the new Soniva Journey in the Maldives, and Soniva Kiri in Thailand. The size of villas ranges from one room to nine rooms. A yacht named Soniva in Aqua allows customers to stay on the ocean for one night. Its guests are mainly families and newlyweds enjoying honeymoon for two weeks in average, while the guests from Asian countries normally spend about a week there. Where are the guests from? Our guests. Um, the UK is our biggest market. Um, uh, the UK would be about 25% of arrivals. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, UK country of residence, so it's London's become a bit of a melting pot for lots of cultures. <laughs> so um, you know, I'd say UK country of residence rather than just British. Um, Germany is about uh, our second market with about 10, 11 percent. Russia is quite important. Then we have Spain, France, Switzerland um, are, are sort of there in the in the top 10. Scandinavia, of course, and um, for Sineva Fushi, China would be. Not such a strong market, but for Suneva Kiri, it's the number two market. So Suneva Kiri in Thailand, it would be number two. I think for Suneva Jani, our new water villa resort in the Maldives, the early indications is that China will be a top five market as well. Mm -hmm. Compare with the luxury resorts, um, yeah. we actually have a, a, a lot of names coming out to our mind, like Amen, like Bay yeah. and Tree. Do you think you share a same market with Amen, this type of luxury resorts? Yeah, we certainly share a, a similar client base. Um, I mean, absolutely. I mean, we have quite a few clients who go to Amman Resorts and, um, and, and quite, quite a few Amman Resorts come, uh, guests come and stay with us. So mm -hmm. um, I think there's, um, there's certainly, um, and some of our guests notice that, is that we're an owner operator. Um, mm -hmm. I believe that the world of luxury is becoming too institutional. Luxury in general. So you, you go down Bond Street, or if you were to walk down the Bund, and all these names are now owned by two or three big groups. Hospitality, we're seeing the same thing. Um, the luxury brands are emerging. They're buying each other. Um, they're also growing through managing other people's hotels. So they're not owning and operating their hotels. I mean, we're staying here in the Peninsula, and this interview is taking place here. This is a rare exception where Peninsula have a controlling stake in all their hotels. But generally, if you look at all the other luxury brands, they have third-party owners. Those owners are big real estate owners. They could be insurance companies, pension funds, um, big high net worth real estate families, sovereign wealth funds, etc., who might have a portfolio of 10, 20, 50 hotels. And they'll have various brands in their hotels, but they'll use the same architects, same interior designers, same asset managers. And over time, the difference between one and the other becomes the name on the door. And that is a huge risk. They become too nondescript because they grew through managing other people's hotels. And over time, the only difference was the name on the door. And you can't command a premium 
if that's your only point of difference. And I think over time, brand loyalty um, is a direct correlation of brand consistency. This has been a, a little bit of a soft period the last two years. Some of our main markets have suffered. Do you still can get very uh, good profit every year? Um, it, it can, yeah, it can be quite profitable. Um, what is because... the figure? Can you tell us? Chasing 25 Every year, um, it, it can yeah, it can be quite profitable. Um, what is because, the figure? Can you tell us? Um, we're making about a 40, 45 percent operating margin, which is not bad in the industry. Mm -hmm. um, um, in in some parts of the world, you know, hotels make 50, 55 percent uh, gross operating profit margin. We're a little bit up below that, but mm -hmm. um, but we see that picking up as well. And and th this has been a a little bit of a soft period the last two years. We've had. Um, some of our main markets have suffered. So if you think about the perfect storm of challenges, you know, the oil price halved. So quite a few of the super rich who've made money on the oil industry have suffered. Um, Chinese outbound has sort of flattened. Uh, the Russian ruble has halved. Um, as a result of the Brexit vote, uh, the UK pound, you know, our main market, their currency has dropped about 20%. So um, all of those things have softened demand, but uh, fortunately, um, touch a bit of wood, where we're still managing, yeah. But would you change your strategy with all these outside effects? Also to focus on destinations where they will run out of uh, space before they run out of clients. So if you think about the Maldives, um, actually about 1,100 islands, about three to 400 are locally used. There's a capacity to have about four to 500 tourist resorts, that's it. Today we have 120 tourist resorts with 1.2 million people. Um, Phuket, the island of Phuket last year had mm -hmm. 6 million tourists. I think there are about 2 million Chinese just in, in Phuket. So um, if the Maldives would get, would get to Phuket's number, they'd have run out of islands already. And that's a very, very small number. 90% of our business in the Maldives generally is long haul, not just ourselves, but all, all resorts. So that's... Um, um, and, and we've got such a big market in a short haul distance. You know, you've got India, Southeast Asia. So, um, so I remain quite optimistic about the Maldives and its future. Um, and our future strategy will always be to go to locations where there's a rarity and there's a scarcity and one would run out of space. Or like six, where? Um, we, we, well, we quite like uh, urban environments. Our focus is the leisure traveller, not resorts. So um, London, for example, or Paris or New York. Um, we've seen cases now where... Um, some hotels, 80 to 90% of their business is either leisure travellers, pure leisure, or pleasure, people coming for a conference uh, or, you know, one, one sort of board meeting and then spending three or four nights in the city. And, and that can be a virtuous circle because the more leisure travellers you have in these cities, the more these leisure travellers go out. So the more money there is going into restaurants or theatre or museums. 
And, um, and you're seeing that in London now. I mean, it's been a, a, a beautiful sort of virtuous circle like New York as well. We'll want to go to those cities. So what, what, will, what will be the result? You'll either have wait lists to go to hotels there or the prices will rise, you know, above average. And we've seen that. If you look at London in the last five years, um, the UK economy has gone through this, the wor worst recession since World War II. Yet um, it's hotels. It's, at least it's Mayfair and Knightsbridge and prime central London hotels have done very well. You know, they've opened to, with great rev pars. So, so I think that that phenomenon will continue and our focus is on those locations. And the Maldives is certainly one where there's a rarity factor and a scarcity factor. Since 2011, Suniva has started selling its private villas to foreigners. The owners can purchase villas under leasehold, getting 10 years of the property and 99 years of ownership. Meanwhile, if the villa is available, Soniva is allowed to rent it out and manage it. And the revenues will be divided between Soniva and its owners. In 2011, you start to sell properties in Maldives resorts. Uh, the, the government changed the laws. They extended the leases and they allowed us to sublease. And so we started then. How are the sales? Very good. Uh, we've sold... Uh, 18, of which we've built 15, mm -hmm. and um, another three are under construction. Does it bring you a lot of profit? Uh, it's, it's a win-win all around. So um, uh, from our perspective, it's, you know, we talked about not managing our own hotels. So managing our own hotels, not managing third parties. So um, it's capital intensive. So it's a good way of increasing your room inventory mm -hmm. in a capital intensive way because someone builds their, uh, pays for their house, we build it and then we share the income when they're not there. So they tend to spend a month there. We obviously get all the extras revenues, and then we share the room revenue. So from our point of view, it's incrementally growing our revenue uh, without having to lay out any capital. From the buyer's point of view, given that 52% of our businesses repeat, especially if they come from a high tax environment, they get a return in three forms. Firstly, from the usage. Our owners tend to spend about 15 to 45 nights at the resort. If they were to pay for staying in their villa at our rates, plus pay all the normal taxes, um, that would be equivalent to about six to seven percent of the purchase price. So just the usage themselves is about six to seven percent. They're mm -hmm. not having to pay the bill because they're staying in their own house. And of course, if they're taxed on the income, you know that's obviously tax-free because you're not the, the, the authorities don't tax you for staying in your own house. So it's like getting a gross yield of about. 15% if they're taxed at a 50% tax rate. When they re rent it out, when they don't use it, we rent it out and we give them about a 4 to 5% cash yield. So you've got the usage plus the cash yield and then our rates, since 1995 when we opened, the average rate of Suneva Fushi has compounded more than 8% over the last 20 years. So there's an implication that the if the rates continue to compound at that rate level, there's an implication the yields will grow by 8%. So there's an implication that you'll get a capital gain because obviously capital prices follow the underlying yield in property. Well, if you take all those factors together, um, that would be about uh, something like 18, 19%, yeah. That's if you pretty... take the free room nights as well. Are there any Chinese purchase the properties? Not yet, so no? uh, not yet. Not so, yet. Um, uh, mainly European markets. We have many French buyers. Uh, just in Sonova Fushi, there are three French families that own. It's, it's a question of timing. I, I think, you know, people sort of bought their first home. Uh, they then bought a home abroad in a capital city. Um, and they're now thinking about their third or fourth homes. Okay. So with our families that own, it's usually their fourth or fifth home. So they, they have the principal house which they live in, in the city they live in. They'll have a ski re resort house, a chalet, they'll have one in the Mediterranean, like the south of France or Italy, and, and this is house number four, the, the tropics. So I don't think Chinese buyers have got to house number four yet. I think in the next year or two we'll start to see that, yeah. Certainly we're seeing that in India, from India. We're seeing quite a lot of interest from India. And when you talk to them, these are families that have had wealth for 30, 40 years, and, you know, they already have, you know, their house in India, they have a house in London, they've got uh, houses in the south of France, like around Cannes, and um, yeah, and, and they're sort of quite keen on a tropical house near home. Um, because this whole point of being able to control 
your destiny, reinforce your brand philosophy and your values. Uh, you don't have other voices coming to your ear. Some of these hotel owners, you know, have 10 different brands in their portfolio, uh, but they're using similar architects and interior designers. And over time, all of that starts to look quite similar. Sonu Shivdasani bought an island of the Maldives in 1991 and took four years to build his first hotel resort named Sonny Bafushi there. Later on, he founded Six Senses with Six Senses Resorts and Spas, Soniva and Everson. Eventually, he sold Six Senses in 2012 and only kept three Soniva Resort Hotels and Soniva in Aqua. In 2014, Sailing Capital International invested over 300 million RMB in Soniva Group for resort development in the Maldives. You and your wife first set up the company with the name of the Six Senses, but actually now you sold it out. Why? Precisely what I just sort of touched upon. We found ourselves really, because Six Senses was growing through managing other people's hotels. And with Soneva, we were always the owner. So what, what happened was we built Soneva Fushi back in, we opened in 95 and introduced luxury tourism to the Maldives. Um, we introduced some physical aspects, you know, a hotel villa with a pool. Th this idea of barefoot luxury mm -hmm. or, or the spa, introducing the spa, you know, spa was a rarity. How many resorts were there um, at that time? There, there were about 50 in the Maldives. Today we have 120. Yeah, but they were all mass market resorts. These three German operators would go to a local farmer and say, uh, here, build us 50 huts, we'll send you tourists for 10 years. We give you a 10-year contract, uh, all inclusive. We guarantee 80% occupancy, here's three years in advance. So the farmer goes and builds these simple huts. Uh, everything was very simple. Mm -hmm. Everything came out of a tin. The fruits, the vegetables even came out of a tin. It was like being back at school. Uh, white tile floor, <laughs> neon lights, plastic okay. chairs. And so that was the Maldives historically. And so we introduced luxury tourism. People liked what we did. They loved the idea of a spa and a resort and this whole wellness focus. So they'd say to us, will you, um, will you manage our spa or will you manage our hotel? And my wife said to me, um, if we're not the owner of the hotel, we shouldn't use our name. We shouldn't call it Soneva. And so that's how Six Senses came about because one of the sort of causes of our success was at the time in the 90s was the realization that the, there was a big difference between a resort experience for a guest or what a, a guest staying at a resort hotel was looking for and what a guest in a city hotel was looking for. You know, one was looking for an experience. You know, in a resort, you're unbusy, got a lot of time in your hand. You're looking for an experience. Whereas in a city hotel, you're looking for a product. You're looking for location, quality of check-in, you know, e efficiency of service. So it's very much more a product. And um, that went very well. Uh, we grew very rapidly. Um, and then we found that we had two business models. One was the owner and operator, the other was managing other people's hotels. And I found that as the CEO, my job description was quite stretched in that when you're managing other people's hotels, your priority is to meet with developers to get the new contract. Uh, and get meet profit. with the, Yeah, exactly, meet with the owners to manage the relationship um, and also manage compromises and really just cookie cutter and roll out the original philosophy. And so we realized we needed to sell and split the business. And so Eva and I said, well, we actually like the owner operator thing. And we believe that that has a longer future for the reasons I mentioned earlier, that over time, if everyone's managing, you know, other people's hotels and they're not owning and operating their hotels, how can they really create a, a strong DNA when you have an owner or an asset manager who's saying, we like our hotels to be run in this way. We like our hotels to look like this. How did you sell it step by step? Well, yes, we had a private um, equity firm, a US mm -hmm. private equity firm, that had a stake in our holding company. They gave you the offer first? Well, they were, they were very keen on the management business. So okay. uh, we would discuss this at the board meeting and it, it just made sense for, um, for them to buy the management business and to roll that out, mm -hmm. because that's why they'd invested in, in, in Six Senses at the beginning, was to roll out the management business. And so it made sense, and so we, we did that, yeah. Uh, we had a few assets which, which we owned, um, which, uh, which we owned, um, and we sold those later. So there were a few Six Senses assets, 
that we were also the owner or majority shareholder in. So those were sold um, a couple of years later. But initially, we just sold the brand and the management agreements. And so now we're just focused on Sunevo because this whole point of being able to control your destiny, reinforce your brand philosophy and your values. Uh, you don't have other voices coming to your ears. Exactly. I mean, <laughs> and I think, um, yeah, because, you know, as, as I mentioned earlier, you have some of these hotel owners, you know, have 10 different brands in their portfolio, uh, but they're using similar architects and interior designers. And over time, all of that starts to look quite similar. You know, if you think about some of these, I don't want to mention names, but there are a few iconic brands where you look at their property in Singapore, which is, you know, the origin of their iconic brand, and you go to their property in Dubai, it has no resemblance at all one from the other. And you say, well, because how is they this are in the, the same owner. family? Yeah. But you wouldn't get that dramatic growth, right? I mean, in profit. <clears throat> um, it depends what do you want? What, what's one priority, one's priority and one's focus is. And, and how do you define uh, success? Look at Apple, for example. You know, Steve Jobs came along, <laughs> and I think he, he reduced it from about 100 product lines. They have 100 product lines. So they were following the Hewlett Packard model. You know, they used to make printers, uh, they'd make photocopiers or whatever. Mm -hmm. And he reduced it from 100 down to, I think it was two initially. It was, um, you know, that big uh, multicolored yeah, yeah. desktop <laughs> and the laptop. And, and then he introduced the iPod and so on. If he hadn't done that, if he hadn't focused down, he would not have had the opportunity to, um, to develop the iPod and the iPad because his team and his management team would be so busy, busy trying to fix that fault in that printer or that photocopier, etc. I don't think there's a correlation between um, size and value, necessarily. And you incorporate the sailing capital and build up Johnny, right? Yeah. Absolutely. But would it be other voices to interrupt your not, strategy? Not really, because we're right? the owner of our properties. Uh, they're, 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 they're very, very good partners at the board level. Um, you know, we agree the overall strategy together. We agreed on a business plan before they came in. And so that's been, it's, it's been very good. It's been actually a very, very productive relationship. We, they, they invested exactly two years ago. Um, we committed to open, to buy the land and open within two years. And they said that that's most probably uh, a bit of um, <laughs> a, a tough challenge because uh, no other resort, luxury resort in the Maldives has opened in less than three years. Um, and they wanted a short-term uh, investment horizon, you know, four to five years. So um, and we said, no, we, we can do it. We've got the experience and um, we'll do things in parallel. And uh, Sineva Jani's open. So um, it's going well. And so now on to the next one. Mm -hmm. Selling, like, why did you choose the Chinese company as a, um, a financing support? Um, we were looking for uh, an investor partner. Um, we wanted someone that would recognize the value we had and the potential we had um, that could possibly support us in a market where we were undercovered, which was, um, but which had a big potential for our destination. So China is the biggest market for our two destinations, both Thailand and the Maldives. China is the biggest tourist market. So, and also more importantly, after 25 years of doing business, you know, I started when I was 25, I'm now just over 50. And, um, you know, after over 25 years of business and having investors, you know, what I realize more importantly than everything is it's not how much money they give you or the valuation. It's the it's the sense of partnership and collaboration and the individuals you deal with. According to Huron Report, there were roughly 3.14 million rich Chinese with a set of 6 million RMB in Chinese mainland, increasing 8% by 240,000 people compared with last year. Thus, the market for high-end consumers in China has been continuously expanding. Also, the number of first-class hotels in China grows from less than 2,000 in 2009 to over 3,200 in 2016. Meanwhile, the average occupancy rate is falling. There are three types of boutique hotels. One is the boutique hotels of large hotel groups, such as W Hotels at Starwood. One is professional boutique hotels, such as Bayan Tree and Arman Resorts. The third type is independent boutique hotels with distinctive features, like Suniba, which are occupying smaller market shares. In 2005, 
Bay and Tree started a new business in Yunnan Province, opening its doors to the Chinese people. Later on, hotel brands such as Amen Resort and W Hotels have also established their foothold in Chinese mainland. Uh, have you think about like to open the new resorts or to have some to, to new have business in, in China? In, yeah, in China. Um, we've thought about it uh, quite a lot. We're looking at further projects and further rounds of uh, you know capital, etc., which they're are very open to. So from that point of view, I think it's been great. In terms of building a resort in China, I believe that the Chinese who like staying at Zeneva quite often likes to travel abroad and finds that traveling abroad on one's holiday is the rarity as well. And so I think that our market, our Chinese market, would not want to go to a Zeneva in China. They may go to a Zeneva in Japan, for example, uh, which is a short distance away, it's not too far away. So I, I know all our competitive brands have been very, very keen on having a property in China, establishing themselves in the Chinese market, and that, that served them very well. Um, but I think in the long run, I, we're quite happy not having a Chinese presence. And if we were to have a Chinese presence, it would most probably be somewhere like here on the Bund in Shanghai, focusing on the leisure traveler rather than a resort location. Yeah. And here in Shanghai, I personally see three to five luxury hotels or resorts opening delayed. Do you think Shanghai's market or China market is kind of oversaturated? As we haven't really been looking ourselves as investing in the country, I'm not familiar with the dynamics and the statistics. But uh, what I hear anecdotally when you talk to hoteliers about their rev par is that the rev par is quite low. That means the average rate multiplied by occupancies is generally quite low. There are a few exceptions. I think this hotel has a relatively good rev par, but most hotels in China have very, very low rev pars. And um, you see that as a guest as well. You know, you'll stay in a Four Seasons or Ritz Carlton in China, which will be half or a third the price it'll cost you in some other markets, which obviously implies that the um, that there's a saturation. So um, yeah, I, I think there are just too many at the moment that are opening up. And if there's no point of difference, then that becomes the challenge. So we go and spend, um, holidays in the Maldives, you know, for quite a long period. It, we both felt that we'd stayed, we'd lived there in a previous life, funny enough, together. So we had that strong feel, and we went to government to see if we could just buy a house, you know, um, you know, buy an island and build a house. And they said, no, you have to do tourism. You are very good an um, investor in terms of to looking for the best place to open the resorts, right? Because the land already get, give you a lot of profit. Value, that's right. We've been quite lucky to pioneer new destinations. <laughs> so we pioneered luxury in the Maldives. Um, when we had Six Senses, we opened the first luxury hotels in Vietnam. So we're very comfortable going into new destinations um, and pioneering them, provided the fundamentals are there. Um, which is, of course, you know, great cuisine, great culture, beautiful location, and access. Uh, one of the phrases we've always used is remote but accessible. So locations like feel they're in the middle of nowhere, but they're easy to access. In other words, you have lower cost to get these islands, right? Because they're remote, that's yeah. right, and they're not established destination, certainly, and it allows us to buy more land. At Suneva Kiri, we have about 150 acres, whereas a typical resort in Thailand, if you look at all the other luxury hotels, their site would be about 15 acres. Mm -hmm. So our site and our land is about 10 times, but the price was 20 times less. So we still spent half of what other developers spend on their land as part of the total cost. Mm -hmm. If we can render it accessible, mm -hmm. so it's nice to be remote, but if it's remote and remote, then it's going to be a difficult because luxury travelers need easy access. So 
Um, as I mentioned, it was half the distance of Koh Samui. It's only 150 miles away. So we said, well, why don't we just lease some land, build a small airport, mm -hmm. and then operate these small planes? Which is how we started in the Maldives. Uh, Suneva Fushi, we were lucky to get as a foreigner. Uh, we actually introduced luxury tourism to the Maldives, but we also introduced um, outer atoll tourism, tourism beyond just the Mali atoll. And um, it's only 60 miles away. So um, on a good day, it'll take about three hours by boat. And a bad day, it was taking some guests about three days to get up there uh, before you had air transfers. Um, and so um, we saw the opportunity to take that island and then, you know, put in air transfers. Sunu Shiv Dasani, born in London in 1965, is an Indian British. He studied at Eton College and later graduated from the Oxford University with a Master of Arts degree in English Literature. His happy marriage with Eva is well known. After visiting many hotels and resorts in person, they yearned to found their own hotels and then they set up Sun Eva, bearing their name. They lead a simple but quality life targeting sustainable expansion in business. Sunu keeps up an exercise routine while busy working. He well combines his philosophy for life and business concept. You never had any working experience in hospitality industry. That's right, yeah. Why do you decide to jump into this? We go and spend um, holidays in the Maldives, you know, for quite a long period. And, um, uh, we loved uh, the environment, you know, we loved the geography. We arrived there and it, we both felt that we'd stayed, we'd lived there in a previous life, funny enough, together. So we had that strong feel. Uh, we loved the just destination, but in those days, as I said, the hotels were very simple. We, we, we loved the destination. We thought we could um, build a, buy, buy, uh, rent an island, build a house. The government said, absolutely no way. Uh, you have to do tourism. And um, we were looking at what to do and um, it seemed like an interesting project. We felt that <coughs> the Maldives had great long-term potential because it was a very beautiful destination, quite unique to everything else in Asia. And um, Asia was growing as, a, as, a, as an economy, as a region. So we felt we could benefit from that. And Eva is the creative director. She's our creative director. So I, I work on the conceptual architecture. She's the creative director. We build, in the Maldives, we build our resorts ourselves. So we bring in the materials, we hire labor groups. Both Ava and I are passionate on sustainability in everything we do. Um, so I'll turn off the shower and put the soap on and then put the shower on again. Uh, you know, we're quite careful about what we eat in terms of sustainability, in terms of wellness. Uh, we love to learn new things. We like to travel. I believe that learning is so important. You know, I, I don't think that one should stop learning when one leaves university because it's so enriching to learn new things and it's so rewarding. I think more, more and more people will get in, into this into kind of this. phenomenon. Well, thank you for coming to our show, Maisel Milanese. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having me and I really enjoyed our, our discussion. Thank you.